local is when you're looking at something like Chipko and Chiapas and those kinds of things, I, I think you can do ecology at the local level. But when you're doing large animal conservation, the local is often, as I said, the, the, the victim. Um, and so it, it's a little more complicated for me. Um, but sidestepping that question, I do think that there are lots of ways of tying this together. I mean, you mentioned the guy of sort of eco-feminist theology. Um, you know, even um, evangelical Christians now have this creation care kind of buzzword. Um, I think there's other theories that we have available to us to help think about um, uh, ways of formulating a larger project than a local. Pantheism, process theology, process thought, out there North Whitehead. Sometimes when you talk, or when I read you, Tim, I think Buddhism. I don't know if that's even Hinduism, especially in relation to animals. That happens to me too. Like think <laughs> when, I, when I talk. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, there are other um, non-Western formulations or non-Enlightenment formulations that could posit the Earth and its materiality. It's not denying materiality; it's interpreting it differently. Like I think of the Native American. I mean, this is Vin De La Rosa. Um, position that s places are saturated with ancestors. That's why you can't buy and sell them. And, you know, I think about how different that worldview is from people who buy cemetery plots to die in. And that, you know, we've just sort of come such a long way as a re or such a far way um, as a result of capitalism and enlightenment individualism. And that there are lots of tools out there to weave this back together. Um, a lot of them have pitfalls that we have to talk about, but I think those things for me are, are healthier than a global ledger of accountability because from the perspective of animals, who owns them? You know, does, do Africans own their animals now or do we all own them? We killed all ours in North America. Uh, why do we get theirs? Yeah, we keep them. Yeah. Back to the question of the concept of environmental racism. We'll talk, we'll ask you to talk a little bit about um, something that's come up, particularly around transgenic experimentation. Bioethicists talk about this. Um, Carrie Wolf, literary critic, several other literary critics. The concept of speciesism and racism, and whether yeah. these, where that boundary is, yeah. how you understand those two things together. Um, I mean, Kathy, we're talking about these theologies, how they might right. help us. Personally, I don't want to see um, species of as a continuation of racism. I really think these are different questions. But again, transgenic experimentation, which seems at the heart of a lot of what you're talking about, has raised that issue mm -hmm. of you know, the boundary of the human. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering if that is a direction to take. Yeah. You know, yes. I mean, um, in, uh, the animal rights people always sort of want to go from, you know, racism and slavery into liberation of animals. And I resist that too. And part of the problem here is that we only have this one category, right? We've got this category human and we have other. Yeah. And so racism in some ways, or the eradication of racism was about getting dark skinned people into that category. I don't think we. I don't think it's the right thing to get and anim, push animals into that category. They're not, yeah. right? They don't have the same capacities, abilities, etc. It's not to say they're lesser. We have to have a great. We need another model that's not just about the human and the other, yeah. and that some of these other um, systems, like Buddhism or um, Aboriginal, you know, yes. certain Aboriginal can give us insights into how to sort of um, challenge the validity of the human. I mean, this is the nature culture thing, right? Culture is anything humans do, nature is everything else. And <laughs> it's that that we have to kind of figure out how to disrupt. Um, and so, no, I'm not in favor of, uh, of giving animals rights. Um, but I'm not sure I'm in favor of rights for anybody at the moment. Can I, can I speak to that a little bit? Because I, I went, I've been through a very, very short version of what Kathy said, I think it would be just explained. And 
it, that's so great to do this panel because it's almost as if we're tel telepathically. Can we just <laughs> met an hour ago? I, 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 I wasn't meaning to be flip. I want to say, when I, when I said that some of my thoughts, I recognize Buddhism because I study Buddhism very seriously. And um, I think that actually that's a major problem. Um, I'm not answering your question, of course, all of a sudden. Um, that's a major problem for us humanists here, yeah, that there's a kind of hangover of Orientalism and primitivism and exoticism in our resistance to like embrace and explore and get into other non-Western, whatever you want to call them, ways of ways of thinking about things. Um, and I, I think in a way, um, in, a, in, a, in a strange paradoxical way, at least the way in which a certain kind of Foucault, a certain kind of Derrida, a certain kind of Deleuze and Guattari has been received in the academy, even in, even in post-humanism, let's say, hasn't really helped very much because, because there's a sort of phobia there of subjectivity. And that's what it boils down to, is an idea that subjectivity as such is a, is a toxic category that needs to be either gone rid of, but nobody really does that, or ignored. You know? And so in some way, um, when people bring up spirituality, um, I think we need to have a conversation about how these things can actually enhance a left view. Mm -hmm. if, even if for the only, for, for, for just for the strategic reason that we don't want the right owning all that stuff, right? Um, so, yes, speciesism and racism, firewall separation for me. I disagree profoundly with Kerry on this. The idea that speciesism uh, uh, subtends racism is itself a speciesist concept and furthermore a racist one you know, to, to, to the extent that the descent of man for example was written to you know attack the, the idea that race was a biological category right that actually ra race as such is a racist category according to Darwin because most of why I look the way I look is because contingently someone thought that way was sexy about three million years ago possibly with no other competition Right, so there was no, it wasn't a casual taste thing where somebody ex exhibited good taste. They just happened to like the way reddish facial hair and white skin was, yeah. And so from the evolutionary point of view, and this is also where queer theory gets into at least mammals, there's this concept called satisficing, which basically means that if you've got it and it's not killing you, you can keep it, right? So whatever trait you have, you can keep it from an evolutionary point of view. There's, there's no reason why some things happen the way they happen. There's no reason why. When you start looking for reasons, you're already locked into a kind of problematic discourse there. So I don't think that speciesism subtends racism. In fact, quite the other way around. I think there's some kind of way in which um, racism percolates into environmental thinking. Um, through this notion of species, through this notion of other. I'm too, I'm very troubled by this word other, and I'm trying to come up with something else. And what I'm coming up with is um, strange stranger, which is my bad translation of the Derrida's word arrivant, right? Which is a, imagine, a, imagine a, a visitor that you couldn't possibly anticipate, that you couldn't possibly um, prepare for enough, that you couldn't possibly, so that idea that basically, um, you know, and, and, and we are those strange strangers too, right? So that in ecological thinking is a strong vein of uncanniness, right? Which has been edited out of a lot of ecological language, which paradoxically actually performs the same function in a way as the Foucauldian, Derridian sort of diluted version or mistranslated version that some people have, which is this sort of uh, uh, subjectivity phobia idea that basically somehow there's this thing from the deep ecology point of view, there's this guy in the system that just works. Human beings are like a viral kind of aspect of that that may or may not be wiped out, who cares, right? Um, in a way, that is capitalist ideology, just in a, in a very kind of seemingly anti-capitalist key, you know? And it has to do with this, with this sort of terror of actually being a subject. Being a subject means feeling very weird, at least me, as an introverted person, I think subjectivity is feeling very weird, which involves uncanniness, which involves hesitation, which involves a feeling of irony. You know? So any view that, that doesn't have irony in it, it's intrinsically suspicious. And I don't mean irony like a, 
sort of t-shirt, I'm so cool, irony, I mean, really serious irony that makes you feel a bit ill. <laughs> you know, sort of, in a way, science is irony, because science is being ready to be wrong, you know, isn't that what irony is?